everybody. Thanks for joining us today. With me are Danny Fries and Jackie Zupchik. Did I say your name? I just I just asked you. Close enough. That's it. That's it. Sorry. Uh, so one of the things that I love about technology is that it's so quick and easy to build solidarity. And recently, Danny and Jackie reached out to me and they told me they were building a coalition of writers who are trying to make sure that we can continue to get paid for our writing. So this was music to my ear. So I'm going to turn it over to you all to tell folks about the coalition and then we'll talk about uh, maybe some of the downsides of technology. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Um, and we're really excited to talk about this. So Jackie and I work with a gentleman by the name of Bradley Tusk. Um, he's an author of two works, one nonfiction and one fiction, which just came out. He's a longtime political insider, venture capitalist, philanthropist. Um, he's the owner of an independent bookstore, which is actually on the, um, and the founder of, of the Gotham Book Prize. And as an author, owner of the bookstore, founder of the book prize, this issue um, sort of came to him, came to light. Um, about Spotify's new offering of audiobooks on their platform. Um, and he's kind of infamous for personally taking on big and hard causes that he cares about. And this certainly sort of falls at his entrenchment in the literary industry and also <laughs> his outspokenness on big tech. So Jackie and I are very lucky to work with him and really excited about um, sort of raising awareness about Spotify. So as part of that effort, we've launched a coalition, which is a consortium of authors, writers, creators, and the main goal of the coalition is to really raise awareness um, about this offering and the threat that it potentially poses to the literary industry. Um, really early days, but you know, Kim, early joiner, really excited about that. Um, and yeah. So, so one of the th mm -hmm. go ahead, Jackie. No, I was just I was just going to say. I mean, Danny, maybe I think it'd be helpful to explain. So, so Spotify came out with this offering. They rolled it out first in in parts of Europe, specifically in the UK. Um, and now they're, you know, they've launched this just in the past couple of months in the in the U.S. Dan, you want to explain a little bit what the actual what the model is, and probably, you know, for the purpose of this conversation, the most critical piece is how do authors get paid? Yeah. So as part of a premium membership on Spotify, and it's only in the U.S., U.K., and Australia at this point, um, you get 15 hours of free listening to audiobooks on their platform, and then once you pass that threshold of 15 hours, you can pay an extra fee for um to to basically get more hours um of listening and all of the big five publishers have agreed um to to participate in this offering i think that's part of the problem we'll talk about today is a lot of authors basically saw their their works on spotify and had no idea that this was happening um so really the lack of transparency and communication from both publishers and spotify is really a big issue um that we should dig into today and, and as a writer, the thing that worries me is that on average, when people listen to an audiobook, they listen to about half of it. And the way that Spotify's offering pays writers is they, they only pay the percentage of the royalty that the person listened to the book. So like right off the bat, I'm going to get half of what I would have gotten if you if you bought the audiobook in some other way. Um, you know, and obviously Spotify claims that, well, we'll make it up in volume. Uh, but je le doute. Uh, so so say more about what other authors are are telling you all. And then I'll talk about my perspective on this from a you know tech uh, exec point of view. Yeah, I think one of the biggest things we've been hearing is the anxiety around the potential of the threat to the actual format. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we all saw how Spotify changed music, songs became yeah. shorter, optimizing for the algorithm, all of those things. Um, and books, books, you know, this is, they're a completely, first of all, separate medium than both podcasts and music. And we'll talk about later how bundling those all on one platform um, isn't the best thing for, for any of them. But I think what happens if books are written with the hook at the beginning versus the end? Will authors start optimizing for, for the algorithm and for the platform? I think there's a lot of anxiety around the fact that streaming books is going to devalue this really critical, important art form. I think the other piece yeah. of that is, at least with music, 
think the stat is something like 90% of, in the music world, 90% of royalties are going to the top 0.8% of musicians on Spotify. So how, you know, how is that going to work for authors? That's one of the big things we're hearing. The other piece that we're, that we're hearing over and over, and Kim, I know this is a big worry of yours too, so maybe we can jump straight into this piece, is this concept of free. Right. Yes. I think many of us, like, what does that mean if you're you're able to just pop on to Spotify and listen to consume a book for free? What is what does that do? Is that I mean, it seems like a slippery slope to me, but would love to hear your point of view on that piece. Yeah, I mean, I think so. What I'd love to do, if it's okay with you all, is take a big step back and kind of explain to people how these mm -hmm. tech platforms work, because I think that. I think that the the problem with free become for quote unquote free becomes much more clear if you understand what's happening on these platforms and what they're doing to us both as consumers of content, whether it is a song or a book or an article in the news, and uh, and also what it's doing to the creators of this content uh, because ultimately. If we allow these platforms to follow the logic, the, the natural logic, they will kill the goose that laid the golden egg. Uh, so anyway, um, a, a, a tech platform for content, a content tech platform, begins to uh, uh, create value for users when it makes it easier and cheaper for them to consume a lot of content. And so we saw this, for example, with iTunes was an early, and I spent a bunch of time at Apple. And, and you got to remember when this started, it started at a moment when Napster was, was basically allowing people to, to, to steal music easily, with, they, to not pay for it. It was truly, not only was it free, I think it was acknowledged at the time that it was stolen. Mm -hmm. So... So now all of a sudden, Apple said, people actually like musicians. <laughs> people care about musicians. And if we give the, if, if we make it just as easy to pay for the music as it is to steal it, then people will pay for it because people are basically honest and they care about musicians. And that actually worked, believe it or not. So it was like, it, it was after the music industry was fall. I mean, I think the revenues had been cut in half. In a, in a period of just a few years. So like it was in free fall and, and the, the platform stopped it at first, iTunes. So, so let's like give some credit where credit is due. But then, then what happened? Then, uh, you know, actually it was Rhapsody before it was Spotify, but then people were like, oh, let's get all the music and bundle it, it you know, make it like a, like a vacation at, um, <laughs> what do you call it? You know, one of these, uh, uh, all you can eat kind of situations. And, uh, and, and there was at this period still people kind of believed in the long tail. Oh, this will be great because now people will explore. They'll, they'll be able to be, be exposed to new music and new musicians. It'll be easier for new, new mu musicians to get discovered. But that is not what happened. What happened when music got bundled is that that you know all of the, the 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 users went to the same place and this is the logic of discovery if you think about how google works the big innovation was page rank and page rank took relevance plus what most people want and it turns out it sent everybody to the same place because we want the same stuff so the, the promise of the long tail was not, not delivered. So that was all happening in terms of discovery. And then you, you, you think about, you know, now payment, how are people going to get paid? Uh, and, and again, all of the money went to the head of the, of the platform. And, and then you, then you, you start thinking about other ways for how is the growth going to happen for the tech platform? And so they need more content and they, they're excited about not paying for the content. And so then they int start introducing free content and very often free content. Um, you know, it, 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 I led the AdSense network for a long time and, and the, the free content was often, uh, you know, 
not not very it, it wasn't as researched people didn't spend as much time creating free content <laughs> as they did uh paid content and now all of a sudden the the tech platform has an incentive to start feeding you as the consumer the free content because they don't have to pay for it so now you're mixing professionally created content and free content and that's a problem and then you introduce ads into the equation and and now you know and wall street is the backdrop and so i don't really I don't blame the CEO for Spotify for making the decisions that he's he's making. That is that that, that is, the logic of the market is driving him to do what he's doing, which is to uh, pay as little as possible for the content that you are consuming and to drive you to consume content that he doesn't have to pay anything for. So that's kind of how the platform works. How does things, I mean, just going back to this idea of, of books being free and Danny, I'm curious your, your two cents on this too. I mean, one of the big questions that has been in every news article that's basically come out since Spotify made this announcement is, you know, is Spotify going to do for books what it did to music? To which I say like, ding, 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 how could it not, right? Yeah. At least in some, it feels crazy to even be asking that question. Um, what, I mean, what does it actually do for the medium of books if, if we're starting to consider books as free? Like, I, I mean, Kim, one of the things when you and I first, when we all first started talking, like how long did it take you to write Radical Candor? I mean, this isn't something you just did willy nilly over the course of three weeks, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, it took me four years to write Radical Candor uh, and I was working on it pretty much full time. Like I had, I had a job and I quit the job and it was a very lucrative job. And I quit my lucrative job in order to do this thing because it, because I cared about it, because I thought it was really um, important to do. And, and, you know, I was in a situation where I could afford to do that, but, but, you know, thanks to my working in tech, uh, building this thing that killed what I love, that is may kill what I love. But anyway, I, most people cannot afford to quit their job and work for free. And if we want people to be able to write, if we want people to be able to create music, we can't expect them to do it, you know, from 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. Like people also need to sleep. Yeah, that's interesting because I think, I think it was late December, Spotify announced their, their new royalty model for music. So tracks that receive now less than a thousand streams within a year period don't qualify for royalties. Um, yeah. And that, that's to, yeah. to overcompensate on the other end and to drive more revenue to the, the more popular artists. So we, we know these things are gonna happen. It's just, what are we gonna do about it? Yeah. And even, wasn't there an article recently, even I think it was Puff Daddy said he had a billion streams on Spotify for which he was paid $45,000 or something like, like the, the, uh, even, even people who, who are, are listened to quite a lot are not paid that much. I mean, I don't know what you have to, how many streams you have to get to get paid, you know, a, a, a lot of money, but a billion yeah. seems like that should be enough. Yeah. And th there's the fundamental difference, obviously, between music and books is people, I listen to the same song over and over again. You only really yes. listen or read a book once. Um, yes. So I think we have to take that into consideration, too. Yes. And, you know, and a book, not only does it take four years to write a book, um, it takes a long time to listen to a book. And and you get a lot of value by listening to by, by going deep mm -hmm. uh, on on an idea. In fact, when I was in when I was in high school, if you used Cliff Notes, you got you got expelled from the school <laughs> because we were taught that you you've got to really read the book in order to understand the book. It, reading the Cliff Notes doesn't count as as reading the book. Um, you know, I, I think there's a time and a place for a summary, by the way. I'm not saying nobody should ever summarize a book, but but you you do get something out of listening to the whole book that you don't get out of listening to a summary of the book. And yet 
And yet Spotify has every incentive to just send you to the summary of the book that maybe somebody else, not even the author wrote. If you look on Spotify, you'll see a bunch of summaries of my books that I did not write, that I get no benefit from those sales, but Spotify doesn't care. And by the way, the same thing is true on Amazon. Not to rabbit hole too much, but man, I, I, you know, we talked about this a bit earlier, but we really just feel like we have the attention span of of flies these days. Like I, even, you know, there's NPR has a new thing out that's just an overview, a 30 minute overview of different of different books. It feels like we have to at least do something to protect the medium, you know, the original medium of of books and now audiobooks, which obviously are are such a big part of that, a big part of that as well. I wanted to ask Kim, you know, we had talked a little bit and you touched on this earlier, the the potential, like what is it, what happens if ads end up, you know, I'm listening to a radical candor and all of a sudden I get interrupted 20 minutes in to hear an ad from Cheerios. I don't know, whoever, whoever yeah, it is. Yeah. Like, what, yeah. Does that, what does that do for the, what does that like as an author, what would that mean to you? What is, what does that do to the medium? Yeah. I mean, uh uh, it distracts your flow. If you, if you, uh, I don't know about you, but when I listen to a book, I really get into a flow. I go into like, a d in fact, it's interesting. My, my watch when I'm listening to a book thinks I'm asleep. Like I'm literally in, I'm in a flow. So I'm not asleep, but it, I'm like, my breathing slows down. I'm still, it's I th that's why I love to read is because it does that for my mind and for my body. And uh, and so if I get a Cheerios ad in the middle, I'm, it's going to interrupt the flow. So that's one problem. It's going to interrupt concentration. And it's we know that when we that when we interrupt a flow state, it's much harder to get back to it. So I think it's it's not a good way to consume a book to have it interrupted by ads. Um, and, and I also think that it's a, it is, I mean, look, I worked at Google on AdSense. I think in my time there, we served a trillion ads. So I am part of the problem here. But I think the advertising model is not a great way to fund our consumption of content. We, sh we should pay for the content that we want to consume. Maybe it needs to get made easier. But the problem is, like, if we go back to the, these tech platforms, so there's sort of there's there's a network of content that attracts a network of users or you know consumers mm -hmm. of the content, and then there's a network of ads. And if you think about how these networks and, and networks have what what are called externalities, so the bigger the network, the more useful the network. So if you think about a telephone network, for example. If only the three of us are on a telephone network, it's not that useful. But if the whole world is on the, you know, so for every person you add to the, the, the more value it is. So, so once you get a critical mass of content, then that helps attract a critical mass of users. And now the content providers, the person who, the content creators, they have to be part of the network because that's where their users are. And so now the, 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 the tech company that is managing these two networks can can pay the content creators less and less and charge by the way the users more and more that's why they have these giant market capitalizations and then when you add ads into it uh then then the then the the sort of enshittification of the <laughs> as it's called of the network really begins because now all of a sudden the the tech platform has an incentive to drive you to more to, to sort of be more and more addictive because for for every bit of time you spend on the platform once you're dr dropping ads in um you know they're getting paid and so they have uh, they have an incentive to make their platform addictive for the for the users who now are appropriately called users and uh, and they have an incentive to to make you spend more and more time on content that they don't have to pay for because the you know the, the advertisers don't really care about much about the user experience or what the user is is consuming at that moment and and the ads then 
shorten our attention span because they want to interrupt you every every 45 seconds if possible. Uh, uh, and so it's really a race, a race to the bottom in, in, in terms of the, lo uh, the logic. And yet the market rewards this short term um, situation. So it's, it's, a, it's a hard problem to break through. It's understandable why users are addicted. It's understandable why why the tech platform creates this this addictive situation. It's understandable why the advertisers. You know, I'm not trying to to say all these people are evil, but we created this system, and we can create a better system. I'd be curious. I obviously the the comparison to to music is easy to see, but. I would love your thoughts on um, if there's anything we can take away from Spotify's foray into podcasting um, and yeah. a little bit step back from it and what we what we can learn from that. Yeah, I mean, so I I I uh, work on a radical candor podcast uh, with a team of people, so I love podcasts and I listen to a number of podcasts. Uh, and I have written two books, so I have two audio books. And I, I think that, that comparing a podcast to an audio book, it's a little bit like comparing uh, a blog to a, an article written by, an, by a newspaper journalist. Uh, so a blog, I can just sit down and write it. Uh, and it doesn't take me that long. And I don't have a whole organization that's doing the fact checking um, that maybe is paying me to do more research. And when all of a sudden so-called user generated content was served up right next to a newspaper article, um, it was much easier and faster to create this user generated content. It was cheaper for the tech platforms to serve that up to people. Mm. And now all of a sudden, and, and the advertise from the advertiser's point of view, do I care if I'm advertising to you, whether you're reading the New York times or whether you're reading, you know, rando, <laughs> rando person's blog? No, I don't. Either way, the ads get served up. And so there was no real way to reward content on these tech, tech platforms that took more work to create, right? And that's the case. Uh, if you listen to the Radical Candor podcast, which I absolutely believe you should, it's a great podcast, but my team and I spent probably for every hour that you listen, um, the Radical Candor team, which includes me and, and several other people, we probably collectively spent about 10 hours producing that one hour worth of content. Whereas if you listen to the, to the, the book Radical Candor as an audio book, you listen to one hour of that. For every hour that you listen to that, there's probably 400 hours of time spent creating that one hour of content. And so I think the, you know, the, the reward should be different. I think that, that it makes sense that, that one should have to pay more for an audio book. Uh, uh, and it makes sense that, you, that we expect to listen to a podcast and maybe be interrupted uh, with ads on it. But these are very different kinds of content. Um, I, I also feel like if we go back to music, like I used to listen to albums much more often. Mm. And I miss that actually, but it's not as, it doesn't make as much sense to do that today. I do too. And it makes you, with, with albums, it makes you think of all the time that artists spend putting, the, why it's in the order that it's in. Yes. And, you know, um, yeah, it's, I think we've lost different. those, yeah, those emotional arcs of albums. Yeah, we, we have, we have. And I, I agree with you completely. Like, all of these mediums are so important. Like, I love listening to podcasts. I was mentioning this earlier, too. Of, you know, podcast, I, I love the off the cuffness of them. There's so many podcasts nowadays. You'll actually hear them say, like, we'll cut that out in post production. And then they never actually, they never do. They just let it ride. Um, yeah. But that's part of what's, you know, that, that, that's what that medium is. And to me, that's the glory. I mean, I, I don't think you would, no one would finish a book if that was the feeling of you having to listen. You wouldn't want to listen to 18 hours of 
something that felt that off the cuff. It just, it just wouldn't, it just wouldn't yeah. work. Exactly. Exactly. Um, but I listened to 18. And by the way, that's the other problem with the Spotify offering. Like a lot of books are much longer than 15 hours. So like now you're, you know, it's, it's, it's actually giving, it, it creates two perverse incentives. One is, uh, for the for the listener, it creates friction for them not to finish the book. And for the author, um, it, it creates an incentive to write, you know, four short books instead of one long book, whereas one long book might be the right way to, to explore the material. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, you personally, you know, as how did you find out about the Spotify offer and were you asked, like, what, what was the process and, and how did you, I know you've opted out from being part of the Spotify premium model, just so if there are any other authors listening, kind of how, how did it come to you and what did you do about it? Yes. So I'm very lucky. Uh, my publisher, which is Macmillan, uh, they, they didn't uh, dump all their author's content into Spotify without consulting their author. So they consulted me. And we talked about it and I talked um, also with my agent about it and we decided it, it didn't make sense to, to be part of this experiment. Um, but a lot of authors were just, they, they weren't even informed that it had happened. In fact, uh, uh, one author, uh, Fowler, said that she found out that her book was part of this program when a friend reached out to her. So I don't know, what are some of the other authors in the coalition saying to you? What, how have they found out? Yeah, so it's interesting. It's a, it's really a mixed bag. Um, like you said, a lot of authors just got their, their titles dumped on, on, on the platform without being asked. Um, and it's interesting, the society, I think it was the Society of Authors came out with a whole list of questions, of questions that you could send your publisher if you're confused about the deal, what it means for you, how you're going to get paid, which a lot of people have found is a really helpful resource. That's definitely something that's out there that you can send. Um, so maybe we'll put a, if there's people who are, who are mm -hmm. listening to us, uh, maybe we'll drop a link to that in the, uh, in, in the chat. Yeah, definitely. But I think what's really interesting is authors just don't, they don't, it's kind of a wait and see period because royalty mm -hmm. statements don't come for the next six to 12 months. Um, and most are pretty unsure if there's even going to be a line item of, of what specifically they're making from Spotify as, as opposed to Audible or, or other platforms. Um, and so that's sort of the big question. Um, and yeah. like, people just don't know. Yeah. The opacity of this is really intense. I mean, uh, so when I get my royalty statements, I will confess, I cannot make heads or tails of it. Uh, and you might say, oh, Kim, well, you're a writer. My, my husband is an engineer <laughs> with a, uh, you know, a, a, a super quantitative mind. Uh, and he also can't figure it out. Like it, it is, they, these, the, these royalty statements that authors get are, I, uh, you know, they certainly are not designed to be comprehensible by any, any, anyone, no matter how quantitative you are. Yeah. And it's interesting because there's also the nuance that obviously publishing contracts differ depending on who the publisher is, but most licenses given to publishers for the licensing of audio does not include streaming. Um, and most of the agreements yes. were drawn up when, mm -hmm. when streaming wasn't even, um, wasn't even considered an option that could potentially happen. So yeah. there's also so there might be some some class some class action lawsuits against the publishers who just dropped their authors. Yeah, um, which is interesting. Content this way. Which yeah. brings me to my next question because I think a lot a lot of people, especially a lot of people in the author community, have been hyper focused on AI copyright, open AI. Obviously, the Authors Guild fired that filed that class action. What what do you think? in terms of like weighing different priorities, especially with the Authors Guild, Society of Authors, when faced obviously with two really existential problems of streaming of books and AI copyright, like how do you balance those? How should we weigh the importance of each? Because um, obviously the focus right now has been really much on, on AI. 
Yeah. I mean, I think that AI is a potential threat, but Spotify offering is a real and present danger. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I sufficient uh, unto the day are the problems thereof. So that's why I've written a lot more about, uh, about Spotify than about AI. Uh, you know, for me, the, the, one of the things that I have been, when I do speak with, with companies I, who, who are working on AI or, or with people who are experimenting with AI. I, I think that there's, there is for, for a, a lot of reasons, a push to make sure that AI at least gives a link to the source material that it is, you know, that, that, that informed it's, um, it's uh, you know, it's answers. And when that happens, I feel much better about the uh, about AI because I don't think you're gonna. I, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but you you know, if, if you're gonna say what is radical candor, and AI gives you an answer and then points you to the book, it's kind of like Google search. It's it's uh, it, it is a way to help people uh, learn, discover your content. The other, the other potential I think that AI has from my perspective is that you can create a large language model that is informed by your content. And then you can get people asking questions about your book, uh, that, that you, that, 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 uh, a specialized, uh, owned by you version of, uh, of AI is giving them the answer. So I think, I think AI is, we're, we're going to have to figure it out as we go along. I don't know yet. Here, here. Um, what, one other thing I've been thinking about a lot with, you know, when, when Spotify first came out with this, came out with this, one of the big things that they were touting was this is going to open a whole new, it's going to bring a whole new group of people yeah. into the audiobook fold. I mean, first off, there's so little data, there's so little data out there that it's, it's tough to say objectively, but I mean, just going off your hunch, what do you, what do you think about that? I mean, so my guess is that a lot of the, there's a giant overlap between Spotify premium users and people who buy books on Audible. Uh, and so, but I don't know, I, I couldn't find the data. I think Spotify will claim that they have, that Spotify premium has, four times more users than Audible, but I just don't know. I, ha I don't have the data. So the answer is, I don't know, but logic would kind of, uh, common sense would say there's probably, there's there probably a lot of the same users. Also, you know, I think audio books, uh, you know, there's, there's, it's not only Audible, there's, there's other audio book platforms out there. Yeah. Um, so, I, I kind of feel like, uh, I, I don't think they're going to make it up in volume, but I could be wrong. I mean, you know, wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> so I'd be, I'd be thrilled to be proved wrong. Um, and to say, oh, we're, you know, this is this bonanza. But my, my, my feeling is that the book, the, the, the market for books is, is not growing, but the, the market for audiobooks is growing. Mm -hmm. In fact, I think the, the market for physical books is down a little bit. Yeah. The market for for ebooks is up a little bit, and the market for audiobooks is up a lot. And so I am very um, I'm very skeptical uh, that uh, that it's a good idea to cut your cut your cut in half on average uh, your royalties if you're a writer from your audio book. Like, why would you do that? Right. For the growing part too, of the market. Yeah, it, it worries me too. Like, just, let's just say, for comparison's sake, it is bringing in. Let's use like the a young a youngish set, a new youngish set that maybe aren't on. Audible and other platforms. So let's say 18 to 22. What we're doing with that set, if they're just going to Audible, is we're reinforcing the free problem, right? We're, yeah. we're you know, we're 
we're setting them up to think that books should always be free, which is, a, which is tricky. It's really, it's really yeah. tricky. Yeah. And it's really not that they're free. It's just that no. you pay Spotify for all your, like, do, do you really want to, to pay one company to tell you what you should con consume audibly? No, you don't. You want, you want to choose what you, uh, yeah. what you, yeah, because yeah. of course, like I, if I get the the, the fifteen hours of, of free listening, I'm gonna go for a book that's shorter, that's gonna fit within within those boundaries. I'm not gonna go for the longer um, fantasy or nonfiction or the other genres yeah. that are longer. Yeah, yeah, and you're probably gonna Spotify is probably gonna push you towards either. Uh, people who they have a like Spotify is going to wind up signing certain people to be only yeah. on Spotify and they're going to pay them a fixed amount. And they're only going to that that deal that Spotify made with that author is only going to pay off if a lot of people listen to that book. And so they're going to push you to listen to something you don't necessarily want to listen to. Um, they don't have any incentive to create a recommendation engine that gives you what you really want. They have an incentive to create a recommendation engine that pushes you towards the content that is most profitable for them. Uh, and like, do we really want to give, give over that part of our, you know, that selection criteria to, to a company that is, that is, uh, you know, motivated by their quarterly earnings? I don't think so. That's a big seeding of, of our intellectual yeah. life to um, an incentive that is in no way, shape or form aligned with our own. Yeah. Um, I think it was earlier this week that there was a New York Times piece um, mm -hmm. I think it was, mm -hmm. it was sort of just like an update on Spotify's offering on the market as a whole. And there was a stat in there that said Spotify has paid out tens of millions of dollars to publishers what, in, in just a couple months. What, what do you think about that? And how would you think this is calculated and how does it trickle down to the author, if at all? Yeah, I mean, a question that I have about that is, did they pay... That, I mean, they could have created misalignment between the publisher's interests and the author's interests. So they could have gone to a publisher and said, we will pay you X to give us your whole, uh, your, you know, your, your whole library. library. Yeah. And, and, and after that, then they start to pay the authors and you, you could easily imagine uh, a, that such a deal might make sense if on average people only consume half of the audiobook. So now authors are getting paid half of what they would otherwise have gotten. And, and Spotify decided it made sense to pay, you know, some portion of that to the publishers to get the publishers to sign up. I don't know. I don't know how the deals got done, but you could imagine that there's a big um, misalignment and in incentive between the publisher and the author yeah. in that case. That 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 Spotify paid the publishers a spiff to put the whole and and that's kind of what happened to musicians, is mm -hmm. that is that the the you know the labels were paid to put the whole their whole library on Spotify and and most musicians got a whole lot of nothing for that for that. Yeah, that's interesting because you look at someone an individual like Marcus Dole who is the the former CEO of Penguin and how anti subscription he was and then it's well, what is the shift in the among the big 5 that's happened and and mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, has anybody ever had the best meal of their life at an all you can eat buffet? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> no, you have not. I'm no. just guessing. Um, yeah. Where it's Italian, Chinese, American, all the different yeah. cuisines. Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, all you eat buffet is not, is not going to be fine dining. And I think we only have so many, <laughs> You know, we only mm -hmm. have so many hours in our lives. And so you want to make sure you're spending time consuming content that has real meaning to you. And if you're, 
if you're consuming instead content that's being served up to you as part of a all you can eat buffet, you're not going to be getting the best. You're not going to, you're just not going to get the best content. Yeah. Agreed. Here, here. Um, well, I want to thank you all, Jackie and Danny, so much for putting together this coalition, for inspiring me. I mean, I consider myself outspoken, but you <laughs> all reminded me, like, you have a voice. You're a writer. Uh, I don't think I would have written the op-ed that I wrote without your encouragement. Um, so thank you all so much for, for the work you're doing to help uh, help writers make sure that they get paid so they continue to write and and also to help create incentives for the tech platforms uh, to to build a better platform because in the end this is not going to be good for them either if nobody writes <laughs> writes books anymore no here here and and would really encourage everyone so the coalition is called the coalition of concerned creators the um the url is in the chat but it's concernedcreators.org um there's a sign up link there to um to just receive updates from the coalition which is ever growing and uh hopefully you'll be seeing seeing the group make more noise over the next couple of next couple of weeks and months yeah and i would encourage um, yeah. as, a, as just you know the the resource of the society of authors questions i think mm. it's also in the chat um and then you know if you're an author and you're listening i would seriously consider of opting out of having your books on spotify and or demand more information from your from your publishers and if you are a reader uh you know buy buy the books go to your local bookstore <laughs> you don't have to only buy them online uh and uh and and make sure that you're choosing the content that you are spending time consuming i one time calculated if you and i read a lot i read you know probably a book or two every week um but if you if you read you know let's say a book a month that means 12 books a year how many more years do you have to live like you have a finite number of books that you're gonna <laughs> read in your lifetime, you should choose them. Don't let someone else choose them. And definitely don't let the market drive what you read. You're here. All right. Well, thank you all so much for the work you're doing. And thanks to folks who tuned in. Take care, everyone. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.